Again, I want to thank our youth for a wonderful service last Sunday, their leadership. And today I want to pick up our series of sermons entitled The Power of Story. I believe each of us have a story, and I believe there are power within our story, especially when we look at the power of Jesus Christ and His transformation upon our lives. So this morning, we return to that with a, a piece of uh, the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. You will also find a, rem, a remnant of this or a similarity of this in Matthew and Luke. And so as we do that, we talk about the story of children being brought to Jesus by their parents. So please hear the word of the Lord. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, he placed his hands on them, and he blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, guide us. Shine your light inside us. Fill us with your passion and breathe life into our souls. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. In the middle of Mark 10, we have a story about children. It's strategically placed between two things that humans struggle with the most, marriage and possessions. Parents were bringing children to Jesus. Children are defined here by Mark of those between the age of birth and 12. The story that follows this is the rich man who does not accept Jesus' advice about material things, nor his invitation to follow him. The story before it in Mark is about divorce. In contrast, we have the children in the middle with virtually no possessions or responsibilities and more likely to respond positively to the opportunity to enter the kingdom of God. The verb bringing tells us they kept on bringing the children. The desire for parents to bring their children to Jesus goes back to a classic Jewish custom dating back to when the patriarchs in Israel laid hands upon the heads. Israel laid his hand upon the heads of Ephraim and Manasseh and blessed them. It says it in Genesis 48, 14, but Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head Though he was the younger, in crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. This was a very popular tradition of the blessing of the father upon children. These proud parents that were coming held out their precious children to Jesus, who took them in his arms and held them close. Jesus places his hands on their head and lifted his eyes to heaven and pronounced a blessing. There are two main teachings in this story, so I don't want you to get lost by saying, I don't have children. I don't want you to get lost by saying, this doesn't relate to me. Because what I want to say to you, it's my guess, and I would bet the farm on it, that each of us are a child. Pretty safe, don't you think? The second thing I want to say to you is that each of us are children of God. Here are the two main teachings. We need to bring children to Jesus, number one, and we need to come to Jesus as a child. The story first is about bringing children to Jesus. The gospel of Jesus is for our children. A blessing, according to Marion Webster Collegiate Dictionary, I made sure I got the collegiate edition for this town, is the act or the words of one that blesses. In the Old Testament, there are two words that are usually translated as blessing or bless. The Hebrew word most often translated for bless is barak, which means to praise, congratulate, or salute. We see it used in the creation when God had finished creating the animals and the creatures of the sea and the birds and telling them to be fruitful and multiply. He blessed it. We see it again in a similar blessing when was given to Adam and Eve to go and to multiply. When God called Abram to go in the promised land, he gave a similar blessing that he would bless him and be with him. 
Another Hebrew word for blessing is esher, which can also be translated happiness. Job 5, 17. Blessed is the one who God's correct, so no, do not despise the bl- discipline of the Almighty. Perhaps the most noted of the Old Testament usage of the blessing is in Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or the wicked or stand in the way of the sinner or sit in the seat of the mockers. Another beautiful psalm to use on the blessing of your children. In the New Testament, we see one that is often translated, a word that is often translated blessing in Merikaros. Jesus used the word in the Sermon on the Mount. More specifically, Matthew chapter 5, we find the Beatitudes. Blessed are those, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. Blessings on through the Beatitudes. The other New Testament word for blessing, we get our word eulogy from, which is a blessing over someone who has died. The blessing is also this Greek word, the word we get for blessing over a meal that I mentioned earlier. It's where we bless the food. And many times, I know that I hear this in prayers, we also bless the ones who prepared it. Have you ever heard that? Father, thank you for this food and the hands that have prepared it. It is a blessing upon them. Some of the cooks in the kitchen at the restaurant don't even know you're blessing them, but I think it's a great idea. God told Abraham, I will establish my covenant, an everlasting covenant between you and your descendants after you for generations to come, excuse me, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. We must understand from the scriptures that Jesus loves children. Throughout the New Testament, we have these teachings. We see Christ's love for children as he celebrates and delights of a mother giving birth. The general love of a father who cuddles his children and the parents which listen to a child's every request. Many of the miracles of Jesus revolved around children. The nobleman's son was healed. The demonized son was healed at the Mount of Transfiguration. Jairus' daughter, whom they thought was dead, Jesus tenderly called her a little lamb and said, Arise. And Jesus, as both man and human and God, loves children. Peter taught us that when we call for repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sin, the promise of the Holy Spirit comes, and he says the promise for you and for your children, let's go further. Not just for then, but for now. The Old Testament is full of insights into the responsibility of parents for the spiritual instruction of children. It's likely the early adult converts from Judaism to Christianity brought with them that commitment. Remember I said that in the time for young disciples, that I think we miss some of that blessing to the children. I was quite moved by that Shabbat experience where the husband read Psalm, excuse me, Proverbs 31 to his wife and the children were blessed by the parents. It was an encouragement to me to see that we need to do more of that. And I thought, how much of that did I do for my children? So I'm picking up the pace with my grandchildren, a word of blessing to them. For sons and daughters in biblical times, receiving the blessing of a father was a monumentous event. What it gave to children was a tremendous sense of being. Not what they were doing, not what you hoped them to achieve, but just the fact that they were a being and they were your child. What we give to children is a tremendous sense of the being the high value of being their parents, their parents, and pictured with a special future for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. At a specific point in their lives, they would hear the words of encouragement and love from the parents as acceptance. So here today, I want us to think about that relational element of the blessings. They're still applicable for today, and I believe in our society they're missed by a lot of us. Just a word of encouragement. Children today are desiring the blessing, the touch of encouragement from their parents. In the Old Testament, it was usually reserved for one special occasion. As parents and grandparents today, I want us to decide to build these elements of blessing into our daily lives. You know, you can do it in a lot of ways, even through a text or FaceTime or email. But there's still that idea of presence and touch. 
A personal and beautiful custom is still found in the Jewish homes. The parents blessed their children at the Shabbat meal. Commonly, the parents placed his or her hands on the child's head and recites the following blessing. It's an exclusive time of intimacy between parent and child when the parent makes the child feel special and loved. Again, not because of what they do or may do or may not do, but because they're a child of yours. In the blessings, the parents recall biblical characters who serve as an example to the growing child. For the son, they would say, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And for the daughters, they may say, may God make you like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, or Leah. And then the following, may God bless you and watch over you. May God shine his face towards you and show you favor. And may God be favorably disposed towards you and grant you peace. What a beautiful blessing. I invite you. If you look in your worship guide, I've given you part of that blessing on the page where the, the pastors or sermon notes are, and you can find that blessing from numbers that I used this morning. Jesus was also in relationship with his heavenly Father. You remember that? Many times he spoke to the Father, and there was an intimate time when Jesus called his Father Abba, which if you interpret it from Aramaic means Daddy. And you all know the difference. When you call your father, father, there's a difference than when you say daddy. Or if, let me put it on the child side of it. When they called me Bob, that was one thing, or Bobby back in the day. But when they called me Walter Robert, I knew there was a different relationship, okay? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so in this, Gary Smalley and John Trent, in their book called The Blessing, gives us five meaningful parts of this blessing. I put them in the worship guide for you. They're on the same page. Number one is meaningful touch. Number two is the spoken word. Number three is expressing high value. Number four is picturing a special future. And number five is active commitment. I want to reiterate it one more time. It's not about what they're going to do. It's about who they are as your child. It was the baptism of Jesus. Remember that? Ray read that for us this morning. That the Heavenly Father spoke to Jesus Within the blessing of the Heavenly Father, I think we find these five elements, if you'll follow. Meaningful touch. The Spirit of God descended like a dove and lighted upon Jesus. The touch of God on His own Son's life. The spoken word was a voice from heaven. The experiencing of how value was saying, you're my son. The picture of a special future, the son in whom I love. In an active commitment with Him, I am well pleased with you. The baptism was something Jesus did need for the forgiveness of his sins. What was it? It was out of obedience to the Father. And here is one of the things we see in obedience to the Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ, I believe, received a blessing similar to this, not only from his earthly father, Joseph, but from his Heavenly Father, God the Father Almighty. Back to the Scripture, we look at the players in this drama, the story of Jesus and the children. The children were not sick. The parents were hoping for a blessing from Jesus. This was a common activity that if a rabbi came to town, everybody wanted to have the rabbi to touch and to bless their children. I saw that the other night at the uh, the, uh, Exact Tech Arena. After Rabbi Zacharias was finished, there was a line all the way the length of that floor of people wanting to do what? To speak to and be touched by this great spiritual leader. The second group in this uh, scenario of the story today are the disciples. Their actions were disturbing. We don't know all the details, but we know the disciples rebuked those who brought the children. They were kind of being the, uh, the protector of Jesus, if I may. But Jesus was indignant. Indignant is not a word we use too often, so let me give you the word we use. He was angry. That's basically what the Greek says. He was angry at those who hindered children from coming to Jesus. As simple as I can make it. He said, let the little children come to me. Jesus was angry at his disciples for two reasons. One is they did not get his concept of what he was trying to do, and that's bringing the ministry of the hope of the grace of Jesus Christ to the world. And the second one is that they didn't get the idea that children need a Savior, just like the rest of us. The disciples discouraging people who bring others to Jesus is contrary to the whole call of the church in the evangelistic movement of Jesus Christ. In this somewhat tenuous moment, 
Jesus taught a theological truth. He made an analogy between the trusting nature of a child for us to understand His saving grace. In regard to parenting, the first and primary instruction given to parents is to teach consistently the greatness of the grace of God and His Word to the next generation. As he, has, as he has said, as one has said, we are just one generation from the Christian faith being extinct. That concerns me. We're not there yet, but I believe in America we are in a very difficult and critical position. I believe that we're in the middle of a generation that is somewhat biblically illiterate with just one step away from Christian children not knowing anything of their faith heritage, of their parents and their grandparents. Why? Because, in my opinion, sometimes the greatest hindrance to children coming to Jesus Christ is within the family. You all forgive me. I'm just telling you what I see. Parents, it's our responsibility. You cannot outsource your responsibility of Christian faith to me, to elders, to teachers, or even to your parents. It is your ultimate responsibility, and I believe we could be in the same category as the disciples when we hinder ch children from coming. This church is about bringing children to Jesus Christ. We provide opportunities, but parents, we can only go where you allow us to go. And when it comes down to it, it's a responsibility that I pray for you every day as I do for my own children and my own grandchildren, that we will catch a glimpse of the importance of teaching and laying hands and blessing children because that was what God has called us to do. Another example of the importance of bringing children to Jesus is from Timothy. You remember that? That's why I invited the grandparents. Timothy said that, Timothy, in your life, I see your faith because I saw it in your mother and in your grandmother. Let me just say it. I've said it before from this pulpit. Faith is not inherited. I know that. I failed at trying to live a life in college of inherited faith. The faith had to become my own. My parents took me and taught me that at some point I had to have ownership of that myself. What Paul gives us here is not three generations of church membership. It's three generations of a deep faith that he hoped would be passed on to Timothy. Perhaps the way we see that the most is here at the baptismal font. Parents, each of us have made a commitment to our children that it is our responsibility to nurture them in partnership with our families and with the family of God, the church of Jesus Christ. We are to bring children to hear his message. We need to bring children to Jesus. And how does that look for us today? Well, I think we first need to bring them because they can't come on their own. I learned this in youth ministry. I used to tell my youth workers we would have a child until 10 and a half. And they said, what do you mean? I said, about halfway through the 10th grade. Because what happens about halfway through the 10th grade? They get a driver's license. And here's what happens. Is when they get that driver's license, the first thing is there's a lot of freedom. But the second thing is, I, I, I heard so many dads tell me this, thinking that they were heroes, and I thought, ah, that bothers me. I want to give my child a car, but they have to pay for the insurance. And that exactly meant that they were no longer going to be involved in the church. Why? Insurance is expensive for a 16-year-old. Some of you know that? And from that, they were working all their free time to get that insurance. Please hear me with all the kindness of my heart. Folks, this is critical. This is what we're about. In the world of children, they depend upon you to bring them. I think the children were, the parents were bringing the children to Jesus. They weren't sending them. They were bringing them. And can't you imagine the experience? Maybe someone said to me this morning as they were leaving the chance, well, this was emotional. This was good. Can you imagine Jesus Christ holding your child and what that did for you, for your faith from that point on? Why do we bring people, children to Jesus? Because Jesus loves children. And we come bringing our children. Sometimes we get too busy. We get our priorities out of line. I'm as guilty as any of you. Please hear that. I hope you don't see it as negative. I'm trying to be an encourager to say, this is a way to bless your children, not just with the hands and the words, but with actions. 
Jesus had already taught them to receive the children in his name and to be careful not to allow them to stumble. Here's the second lesson. The second lesson in this passage is that we as adults come to Jesus as children. We often say that we ought to have children mimic adults, but here Jesus is saying what? Hey, you adults pay attention to what the children are doing. Because the only way you can come to Jesus Christ is as a child. Now, don't misunderstand me at this point. Jesus said, we enter the kingdom of God by faith by trusting like a child, helpless, unable to save ourselves, yet we are totally dependent upon God's mercy and grace. Don't misunderstand me. I don't think as you come to this church, you ought to check your brain at the door and just do it by childlike faith all of your life. But I believe in that moment of salvation, we must come to Jesus Christ knowing that there is nothing I bring, only what he calls me to that salvation experience can I have it. And that means I have to come as a child. In the kingdom of God, we enjoy God and his kingdom by faith, believing that the Father loves us and will care for our daily needs. When a child is hurt or has a problem, where do they go? They go to their parent. I've been with my grandkids, and they get hurt, and I try to help them. They don't want me. Who do they want? Mommy, okay? Let me just pretty clearly, okay? And God, when we have these problems, God wants us to come to him. An example for us to follow. Children are not to be excluded, but they are to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Why do we bless children? David Michael, in his little booklet, A Father's Guide to Blessing His Children, suggests the fruit of blessing of our children from a biblical understanding is the most obvious obvious benefit that we as a parent become a channel of God's blessing to our children, a conduit. And I tell you what, if I'm not blessing God, it's going to be hard for my kids to bless God. And in this, Psalm 145 says, He fulfills the desires of those who fear Him. He hears their cry and saves them. When we touch our children, we touch the future. You ever think about that? We, we may not see all that they do, but we have a chance to touch the future. And the psalmist reminds us that he is with us. The blessing reminds us of the presence of God in our lives. I will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night. My heart instructs me that God wants to counsel us day and night. The blessing can help us heal relationships. This is a rhetorical question. Any of you have any family relationship problems? Maybe I should have asked you to raise your hands, okay? <laughs> well, let me just tell you this. We all have them. I have them in my family. We have irregular people. We have people who don't do exactly what we ask them to do. We have all those. You agree? And there are some days at home, things just don't go as planned. Would you agree? And some nights, you just want to get them in bed, right? Can I just get them in bed? But here's a word for you. A little blessing someone wrote. In spite of all that happened between us today, I still love you and desire of my heart is for your good. Wouldn't that be a blessing to someone that you haven't had a very good day with? I know my wife is going to say tonight, would you like to say that to me before we go to bed? Okay, I know. Okay, so let's be honest. The blessing can strengthen this bond between children and parents. And my favorite thing in closing today that I think about this, about the home and what the atmosphere of the home should be, and I know that you all sing, you know, you have your, where's the shoes on Sunday morning? You can't find one sock. Where's this? You get in the car, and it is not the most uh, worshipful experience driving to church, right? And then we come in, oh, there's peace like a river, I've got peace like, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Am I out of touch with you all or not? And so here's the word that Paul gives us in Colossians. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another, even if, you, even if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds everything together. Do you hear my heart this morning, people? Do you hear the burden that I have for a world where we have children who are marginalized in so many ways? Do we hear about children who never receive a positive word, never have a touch from an adult that is intimate? That may not be happening in our homes, but let me tell you what. There is beyond no shadow of doubt in my mind that every one of us 
can do better in saying blessings to our children and if I may broaden the family and blessings that I want to give to you and your children in this congregation that we may be a people of God who lifts up our children with love and touch and encouragement and blessing. To God alone be the glory. Amen. Again, let me thank you for joining us in our worship today at First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville. I invite you to come on Sunday and join us personally at 1055 in our sanctuary at 106 Southwest 3rd Street in downtown Gainesville. We have other ways to be involved in the ministry offerings of First Presbyterian Church, children's ministry, music ministry, a ministry with college students. You can reach us at 352-378-1527 or on the web at 1stpc.org.